Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So <clears throat> I am planning to talk about uh, the relation between gravitational wave astronomy and what we call the final frontier of cosmology. So this talk will be slightly different from the talks you heard before in this session and the talk you are going to hear uh, after me. And that's because of a reason. Now, uh, why do we call, uh, what do I mean by the final frontier of cosmology? I mean, this fancy name. This final frontier of cosmology is basically detecting the first stars, when the stars uh, formed in our universe for the first time. Why do we call it the final frontier? That's because if you have heard the previous talks, you would have realized that we have a wealth of data in the nearby universe, in the low redshift universe. Similarly, we have a wealth of information from the CMBR at redshifts much higher, 1100 or so. There is a redshift range in between, maybe redshifts from 6 or 8 or 10 to about 1100, which is still to be probed observationally directly. And that's something one is hoping to do using various experiments. And that's why it's called final frontier, because that's what will close the, uh, the story of cosmology. Now, uh, of course, the question is profound, and one would like to uh, answer the, uh, these things about the state of the universe at such early times. Now you can ask, how does the community react to answering these questions? The community has decided to spend billions of dollars. And this gives you some idea about the kind of things those are going on. For example, in a couple of years, a uh, satellite is going up, uh, the James Webb Space, Space Telescope. Again, one of the missions would be to detect these stars at very high redshifts. And then in the next generation, we are talking about the next generation of optical and radio telescopes. And again, here, India is going to play a big role. Uh, in particular, India is a big partner in the 30-meter telescope which is an optical, uh, and then the square kilometer array, which is radio. Again, uh, let me just emphasize that all these things are going to go and try to detect the first stars or the universe around those times, the so-called final frontier. Now, what does this have to do with gravitational waves? So basically, uh, in this talk, I want to just highlight two points with examples, basically. First thing, the detection of gravitational waves actually requires knowledge of the universe at these times. In particular, the knowledge about the first galaxies. The example I will choose here is that the reionization, which I will describe soon by the first stars, can potentially contaminate, it, contaminate the so-called B-mode CMB signal, which arises from primordial gravitational waves. And then there is a reverse thing. The moment you start detecting gravitational waves, or you observe gravitational waves maybe from these epochs, they can st start shedding light on the properties of first galaxies. So the first point is the first galaxies can make the detection difficult. But once you start detecting, you can learn a lot about first galaxies. And here I will choose a slightly different uh, example uh, that has to do with the supermassive black hole mergers at high redshifts, which will be detected are detectable by the so-called low-frequency gravitational wave uh, detectors. So for the first point, again, I will be kind of sketchy here because of the time constraints. So basically, uh, one is attempting to uh, understand the primordial gravitational wave through the B-mode polarization signal, which you will hear about in the next talk. Uh, now, this signal is much weaker. So this is basically the uh, angular power spectrum as you would measure from the CMB versus the multipole number. Now, this signal will be much uh, weaker compared to, for example, the temperature, which is above the scales, and also the E-mode polarization signals. Uh, it's well known that, for example, this signal is contaminated by the lensing signal, and one has to subtract it. And this is something which is well appreciated and well understood by the community. But it turns out that reionization can also generate B-mode, in particular, the patchiness in reionization. What do I mean by that? So imagine this is a slice of the universe. As a, uh, so this is one direction in the sky, and this is the redshift. So at early times, the universe is neutral, which is uh, shown by this uh, black uh, uh, points. And as you go lower, what happens once the first stars from, the radiation from them will start ionizing the hydrogen, and they will uh, give away a lot of free electrons in the medium. So as the regions become white, they are basically represent these ionized regions. 
So as you go uh, to smaller and smaller redshifts, these white regions grow, and at some point, the universe gets reionized completely. <laughs> the point of reionization is it regenerates free electrons in the universe once more. And as the CMB travels from the scatter last scattering surface to us, the photons basically pass through this medium. And depending on uh, the state of the universe, it, they will start scattering with the free electrons once more. This uh, gives rise to uh, electron scattering optical depth, which also gives rise to the E-mode polarization. And this is a well-known story, which, which the CMBR experiment, starting from WMAP, has been detecting these. But the thing is, what you should also realize is that the, this optical depth along different lines of sights could be different, because reionization is not a homogeneous process. It's patchy. So there's fluctuations in this white region. So that gives rise to a B-mode signal. And that is something we have been trying to calculate. I mean, this, again, uh, people have tried to do so uh, earlier as well. What we have come up with is a very uh, self-consistent and detailed model of reionization. And depend, uh, of course, the reionization history itself is quite unknown. And that's something which is going to be probed by the experiments I talked about. Now, given this uncertainty, this is the kind of B-mode signal you expect from uh, the reionization, this, sc this, this scattering of free electrons which of course is still much uh, reasonably smaller than the primordial B mode signal. But what can happen is, for example, if you want to calculate the bias, it will incur in the measured value or inferred value of the tensor, so the so-called tensor to scalar ratio R, which is again a probe of the primordial gravitational waves, uh, uh, normalized to the error in this parameter. So the idea is if this bias becomes of the order of the statistical error, then we would start worrying about uh, the reionization signal, the contamination due to reionization signal. And as you can see with the, I mean, upcoming experiments like Lightbird and Simons Observatory, the errors are still large. And so you really don't have to worry about the reionization. The bias is reasonably smaller than one. But once you go to the next generation of experiments, uh, uh, the, the CMBS4 or uh, PICO or CMB Bharat, which, which are uh, all in planning stage, but given their specifications, as you come to these kind of experiments, what can happen the, is that the contamination and the bias introduced by them can become of the order of that statistical uncertainty. And that's where we need to uh, start worrying about. So this is something really into the future, but this is something one should keep in mind. Also remember that whatever uh, uh, in inferences we have drawn here is based on whatever we think reionization should be. If reionization is different, and uh, that would become clearer with the upcoming experiments, uh, then this uh, figure could also change. And there could be surprises waiting there as well. Now to the second message that gravitational wave observations can shed light on the properties of the first galaxies. Again, this is something which is well known uh, that, uh, for example, the space-based uh, missions like LISA will probe the mergers of supermassive black holes which are residing in the centers of the galaxies. Now, to do that, uh, I mean, to, under, uh, to uh, see what kind of events will be interesting for LISA, people have gone ahead and modeled these mergers. And this basically shows the merger rate as a function of redshift. And you can see the merger rate essentially the uh, peaks around, I mean, basically at very high redshifts, around redshifts of 10 to 15. And that's basically when the first stars are forming. And hopefully, these are the events which would be interesting for LISA. And once you start detecting them, you uh, plan to uh, start understanding about what happened to the universe at these stages. So here also, we tried to uh, see what kind of information one can uh, get once LISA is up and, and these observations uh, start coming. So we have our own galaxy formation model, which has various things. So I don't want to go into the details. But what I want to uh, I mean, uh, emphasize here is that galaxy formation is a very complex subject. It's complex physics. There are various things which go on, like star formation, feedback, different kinds of feedback. And then you have these black holes. I mean, you have to know about their seeding, their growth, and uh, the black, their feedback effects, and so on. All these physics are very uncertain. I mean, we don't know many things about them. So basically, it would be good to have experiments which can shed light on these various processes. And that will tell us about how the universe evolved from how it looked like when the first stars were formed 
till today. So basically the subject of galaxy evolution. So basically what we did was we have our uh, model. It has various switches and knobs which are these uncertain free parameters. So we tuned them uh, by calibrating our model to available observations. For example, again this is, this is an example of what we do. Uh, this shows what we call the luminosity function. Uh, so of galaxies and uh, AGNs, basically quasars. Perfect. So uh, the y-axis gives you the number and the x-axis gives you uh, the, what we call magnitude, which is a proxy for luminosity. And as you can see, so these uh, shaded kind of uh, points are the data points and similarly the yellow ones for the, are for the quasars. And you can see uh, the stars in the galaxies match the luminosity function of, of the Lyman, so-called Lyman break galaxies quite well. Similarly, these are uh, the, the predictions from our black hole model and the black hole models again seems to match the, uh, the, the AGN observations reasonably well. I mean again, uh, when I say match, it match means we have tuned our parameters to match uh, these things and it seems that we get a consistent set of parameters uh, which, is, which is a good sign. The problem is, particularly for black holes, there is almost nothing beyond redshift of six. Uh, so we don't know. I mean, so these are kind of models which have been extrapolated. Okay, there is a, it's a physical model, so it's not like it's, it's a very wide extrapolation. But it's true that you, I mean, you can always say that I don't believe these points really well. So the point is, new observations are always welcome, which can sort out these things. And this is where the LISA can be quite interesting, the gravitational waves can be quite interesting. This is again the event rate versus a uh, 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 redshift. Uh, this is the kind of event rate prediction we have from our models. The left, more, left and right panels are for two different type of models. The physics are somewhat different. So this, has, this doesn't have some feedback, this has some feedback. But the idea is we would like to distinguish between these two models and current observations are not good enough to do so. So we want to find ways of doing that. Now this is the total number of events, but not all of them will be detectable by the experiment. So this is, for example, the detectable event rates, assuming some signal to noise ratio cutoff. The point I'm trying to make is if you come to redshift around this range, you will see that the predictions for these two models are very different as far as LISA is concerned. So the hope is that as these experiments come along, we will be able to distinguish between these kinds of models and that will tell us a lot about galaxy formation at early time. So basically, again, back to my question about final frontier of cosmology, do we understand, I mean, these are all related to how the first stars formed and uh, how they behaved, what kind of radiation came out of them and so on and so forth. Good, so that brings me, uh, ah, okay, this, there are, uh, I mean, this also have other applications. For example, this also may have implications for uh, non-standard cosmology in the sense one can start worrying about warm dark matter uh, particles and constraints on them using similar observations. And also, although I have presented these uh, results keeping LISA in mind, these things will also be observable uh, uh, through the uh, pulsar timing arrays. Uh, we still haven't uh, completed the calculations for these things, but Again, hopefully the results would be as interesting as this. So essentially that brings me to the end of my talk. I mean, I, I'm back to where I started. The point I'm trying to make is gravitational wave astronomy in the future have very close ties with the final frontier of, of cosmology. So I would say that these two communities should, I mean, they have already started talking, but they should really start to talk it to each other uh, more often than that what they are doing now. So, uh, for example, the gravitational wave detection requires knowledge of the first galaxies and gravitational wave observations can then tell us about the properties of the first galaxies. So, thank you very much.